Hello, and welcome to the Statics with Python course. So this is going to be a pretty cool series where we look at different vector statics problems and we use Python to solve them. Now, I want to be very clear that this course specifically is not a course on Python. So I'm not necessarily going to be teaching Python. I'm going to assume that you already know a little bit about Python, how coding works, all of that. But I will go over some of the basics from time to time in case you need a refresher. But the main point of this course is to use Python, a scripting language, a programming language, and create programs and algorithms that can solve a variety of statics problems. So for most of these problems, I'm going to be splitting them over two parts. The first part is exactly what you're looking at here, where we just look at the problem, we go over the algorithm, we write some pseudocode, and then part two is going to be the actual coding part where we go into our IDE and we use Python and we type Python code to solve those problems. So to start off, this is our very first problem. And this is going to be a pretty fun problem. So I'm going to assume that you already know how to find resultant vectors of many different forces uh, by hand, just doing hand calculations where we take the summation of different components of those forces we add them together and we use the like components to find the resultant force. So in this problem, we are going to be finding the resultant of some coplanar forces using Python. Now, what are coplanar forces? Well, if you're used to the traditional Cartesian coordinate system, this Cartesian coordinate system creates a plane, this entire thing. So on this plane, we're going to have many different forces. Here's F1, here's Fi, here's Fn, and we're only going to be dealing with forces in the two-dimensional space. Now, this problem specifically is asking us if we had any number of forces on this plane, what is the resultant vector of those coplanar forces? So this is what we're trying to find. And remember, in order to do this, we need a magnitude and a direction. So our algorithm or our script needs to be able to take in any number of forces. Here I've only drawn three just for illustrative purposes. But again, this could be any number of forces and any number of angles. Now each force is going to have obviously a magnitude here and it's going to have a corresponding angle. So for force one, which is this force right here, it's going to have an angle right there of theta one, and theta one is right there. Now, if you had Fi, and Fi could be, you know, two or three or four, or any force, it's going to have an angle uh, theta i, which is right here. And all the way up to Fn, it's going to have a theta of theta n. Now, you'll notice that all of these forces are making these angles from this horizontal x-axis. So if you had a force that was, you know, somewhere over here, the corresponding theta for that force would be all of this up to, up to that force. So to start off, uh, we are going to have to create two different lists. And these two different lists are going to hold our input. So this is what we're going to be giving the program. And then the script is going to run and it's going to give us our resultant force, uh, which is going to be a magnitude and a direction. So again, the direction is going to be from this horizontal x axis to whatever uh, resultant force um, we calculate or the program calculates. Okay, so we are going to start off by naming one variable called forces, and that's going to hold a list of force magnitudes. So F1, F2, F3, all the way up to Fn. And those, again, are just the magnitudes of any of the forces that are on this plane. Now, there's going to be another variable called angles, and angles is going to hold the corresponding angle that a particular force makes with this x-axis. Now, I want to be clear that these angles are going to be input as degrees. And as for the forces, well, forces you could do in U.S. customary units or metric units. So it's really up to you which units you want to use. I'm just going to call them some units of force. Those are going to be the units. And those units of force, it could be Newton, it could be pound, it could be whatever you want. 
What's more important is that each force has a corresponding direction and that we are consistent with the units of force for all of these forces that we input. Okay, cool. So once we've modeled all of these forces into these two lists, what do we need to do next? Well, I like to do uh, little safety checks throughout my scripts. The first one I want to do is I want to check to ensure that the lists are equal in length. So if they are not equal in length, it means that you've inputted these uh, force and angles incorrectly. So if you had three forces, but only two angles, then that's going to be a problem because, well, there is a force, but you haven't specified an angle. So long story short, we want to make sure that the length of this forces list is equal to the length of this angles list. And we can do that pretty easily in Python. We could do something like length of forces, which is the list, if that does not equal the length of angles, then we want to do something. In this case, I just want to exit the program. And maybe we can even do a little print statement to the console saying, hey, check your input as it is incorrect. Okay, so now we get kind of into the heart of this algorithm. And that is we need to iterate through each one of these forces. And we need to break each force up into its components, its X and Y components. So remember, anytime you have some kind of a force, I'm just going to draw an arbitrary force here, it's going to have a X component this way, and it's going to have a Y component this way. And I'll call that F of X, and this will be F of Y. And when we're solving resultant force problems, remember, we are summing all of the x components together and we're summing all of the y components together of every single force that's acting on you know this particle or object or whatever and we use the summation of the total force components in the x direction and the total force components in the y direction and we use those two numbers to calculate the magnitude of our resultant force so in our program, we need a couple variables to hold the summation of all the X component forces and all the Y component forces. And I'm going to name those variables something like X sum and Y sum. And X sum is going to be the X components or the summation of the X components of every single one of these forces. And Y sum is going to be the Y components of all of these forces or the summation of all of the Y components of those forces. So what we want to do here, kind of step 3A, is to break each of the forces into its X and Y components. So we're going to have to iterate through these forces, and we're going to have to find its X component and the Y component. And we want to keep a running sum of all those X components and Y components, so that's what these two variables are for. And then once we finish iterating through this entire list, we want to find the magnitude of the resultant vector using, well, Pythagorean theorem. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. In our case, A squared is going to be X sum squared. And then B squared is going to be Y sum squared. And that's going to equal the resultant magnitude square. And so if we square, if we square both sides, we'll get our R value, our resultant magnitude. So that takes care of one of the components in our algorithm. So I'll make a little check mark there. Now, the second thing is we need to find the direction in which this resultant force is acting. So how do we do that? Well, I've drawn some more pictures down here. And our fourth step is going to be determine the resultant direction from the x axis. Now, remember, the direction that we want is from this horizontal x-axis. So it could be some positive theta uh, this way or some negative theta this way. But that angle needs to go to the resultant vector. So if I scroll back down here, well, how do we find the resultant vector's angle normally? So I've drawn this little triangle here because we'll need trigonometry. And if we said that this side, the hypotenuse, is the resultant magnitude, well, that resultant is made out of its x component and its y component. And how do we find the angle at which that resultant force is acting? Well, we could do something like tan of theta, or tan of alpha in this case, is equal to opposite over adjacent, and that is y over x. 
So now if we take the tan inverse on both sides, we'll get angle alpha is equal to tan inverse of y over x. Now I put a little warning here because if you know, if you remember from trigonometry, tan inverse of y over x or some number gives us an angle in the range of the first quadrant and the fourth quadrant. So it doesn't actually give us any angles in the second quadrant or the third quadrant. Now that's a bit of a problem, right? Because in this triangle, we're assuming that, well, if x was positive this way and y was positive going up, then this angle will be correct. However, what if x was negative and y was positive? You would know that, well, if x was negative and y was positive, we would end up in the second quadrant right here. Or what if x and y are both negative? Well, if x is negative and y is negative, you would end up somewhere here in the third quadrant. Now the problem there is, well, what if y is negative and x is negative? You know that in this term, the negatives cancel out, right? Negative y over negative x is just y over x. So tan inverse isn't going to give us the actual quadrant that that resultant vector is in. We're gonna have to do something extra. Now, fortunately, in Python, we can use this a tan 2 function, or this method here. And a tan 2 really stands for the arctangent, and 2 means, well, we're passing in two components, and this method right here will take into consideration the individual signs of both of the components that we pass in. And when we do that, a tan 2 will give us, in radians, the angle that is formed when we pass in our y and our x component. And the angle that we get back from a tan 2 is going to be either positive or negative. If it's positive, it means that we're in quadrant 1 or 2. If it's negative, it just means we're in either 4 or 3. Now, a tan 2 will handle most edge cases, but there are some edge cases that we need to handle. If you look at this function, here, you'll notice that, well, if we pass in x is equal to 0, that's going to be a problem. We can't divide by 0, right? That's going to give us an undefined answer. So we need to handle some edge cases ourselves, just to be extra safe. Now, when x sum, when the running total of the x component is 0 and the running component of the y sum is 0, then we want to manually say, hey, theta is going to be equal to 0. That's just going to be our default case. Why? Because, well, if x sum is 0 and y sum is 0, then the resultant force is just going to be 0. So it's not really heading in any direction. Really, it just should be undefined because the force is 0. But as a default, we'll just say that theta is 0 because our resultant force is going to be 0. Now, if x sum is 0 and y sum is positive, then we know that there's only going to be a y component and it's positive, so we know that the resultant vector is going to be acting straight upwards from the horizontal x-axis. And if that's the case, then we know that theta is equal to 90 degrees. Now, if x sum is 0 and y sum is negative, then we know that, well, if the x components are 0 but the y component is negative, then we know that the resultant force is acting straight down. So the angle that is formed is negative 90 degrees. We'll just say theta is equal to negative 90 degrees. And again, that theta is going to be, if this is the x-axis and here's the center and y or the um, resultant force is acting straight down, a theta of negative 90 is just this angle right here. This is theta. Okay, so if none of these cases are satisfied, then we have an x sum that is not equal to zero. x sum could be positive or negative, but it's not equal to zero. In that case, we need to calculate the theta ourselves using the a tan 2 method, and we need to pass in a y and an x. Our y is going to be our y sum, and our x is going to be x sum. And once that's done, we can then just display the magnitude and the direction in the console. We'll just print the magnitude of the resultant force and the direction of the resultant force in the console. Now remember, when we use a tan 2, this method is going to return a number, a angle in radians. So we are, in code, going to have to convert that to degrees. Just because the angles that we've been inputting in our angles list is also going to be in degrees.
If you wanted to do the entire problem in radians, then just input every angle as radians, and you don't have to do the conversion down here for a tan 2 because a tan 2 gives us radians. Okay, so I hope that made sense. Hopefully the algorithm is pretty relatively easy to understand. Again, there's going to be some issues here with the direction, and we have to handle some edge cases down here, but I think it'll make a lot more sense once we start typing up the program. So in the next part, let's jump into the code and write a script to solve this problem.